Before I get started, I kind of just want to preface everything with, uh, although this is semi-purpose built for um, underwriting commercial lending uh, for small to mid-sized businesses, a lot of the concepts are general enough in uh, applicability to where maybe you could extend it for um, a different type of credit uh, risk evaluation. Uh, and really, it's just a story about how a bunch of really great tools come together to uh, create a system that um, you know, if done a different way, could have been a lot more complex and uh, a lot less intuitive. So with that, I will get started. So I work for a company called C2FO, and I'm telling you about C2FO because it plays into the understanding of how all of this works. Uh, but C2FO stands for Collaborative Cash Flow Optimization. Try to say that 10 times fast. Good luck. Um, but we exist because of this problem down here. So globally, there's about $38 trillion locked up in accounts payable and accounts receivable. Uh, that's to say that if you're a company like Amazon, uh, you have hundreds of thousands of suppliers in your supply chain, right? And at a given point in time, if I'm one of those suppliers, maybe Amazon owes me $10 million for some t-shirts. Typical terms of payment are 30, 60, or 90 days for those types of goods. and uh, Maybe I want to, as the supplier, I want to start a new factory or hire some new workers. Uh, historically, they would have had to go through a bank or what's known as a factorer, and they would take a huge discount on the nose uh, to, to get paid early for those, for those invoices that are due to them. But maybe that same day, Amazon's sitting on like 15 billion cash, and they're simply looking to make a 6% rate of return. What C2FO does is facilitates a market where we can match up the buyers and suppliers, where a buyer uh, who has one desired rate of return and then a supplier who's bidding in terms of APR or discount, um, you know, in terms of what they're willing to forego to get paid early, we just match the two up in the market and it's win-win because buyer gets what they want and the supplier gets what they want, the lowest cost of capital available to them. So on a given day, we have, you know, maybe a couple billion uh, flowing through our markets. And this is all possible because we have hooks that go into the buyer's ERP systems and every night we get all of their invoices and we've been doing this for several years. Uh, so that's kind of C2FO in a nutshell. And it's cool when you think about the trickle down effect that that has. When suppliers have access to that capital that they would have otherwise had to wait for, um, and there's a $38 trillion problem out there, the trickle-down effects for the global economy are pretty profound. Um, so it's, it's cool. Anyway, WFC, this is what we're talking about today, the Water for Commerce Fund. So when there is a buyer that is not part of the C2FO network yet, um, and you know that supplier has accounts receivable outstanding with them, we want to be able to help them too. Uh, but we can't do so through C2FO proper. So we created this investment fund, which is also a, a lending platform that will address those, those outstanding uh, buyers as well. So basically, we've developed a systematic underwriting process, um, a systematic prospecting and underwriting process that uses the C2FO data, uh, and like I said, over five years of daily invoices and adjustments. So think about that for a second, daily. When you compare that to what a bank might ask you for as a small business owner, a couple of static, not audited financial statements, which one do you think is more telling of you know, that business's cash flow? The daily information that we've observed over several years or a static, unaudited statement? You be the judge. And we have this information on over 200,000 suppliers currently and growing. As an investor, we're talking about like 40-day duration, 6.25% return, you know, kind of an, an unheard of uh, return profile there. So a very attractive opportunity for investors too. If all of that was clear as mud, I drew a picture. Um, so this is kind of C2FO proper over here where uh, this supplier, for example, let's just say the B1 in this example is Amazon, okay? And they're on the C2FO platform, but this is Target, and this is Home Depot, and this is, um, you know, Nordstrom. Or, well, actually, Nordstrom's one of our buyers too, but Dillard's, okay. So maybe 30% uh, of their accounts receivable are coming from uh, Target up here, and they want to get funded. Um, that's where WFC comes in. 
they would upload those invoices after we you know, had a conversation with them and systematically underwrote them. Um, and you know, we'll, we'll get through the rest. But why are we doing this? You guys have probably heard of a dozen you know, commercial lenders that seems like they're popping up every day to do the same thing. Why even bother? Uh, hopefully by the end of this presentation, you guys will understand you know, why, we, why we decided to go this route um, based on the information that we have. Uh, because at the end of the day, all risk is not created equal. Um, we do believe we have a serious competitive advantage based on the volume of data that we have and the type of data that we have. Uh, we also think we can do it in a very transparent way that doesn't rate gouge. Uh, you might recall that some other big lenders had some very negative publicity lately um, for, for rate gouging some of their uh, borrowers in a very um, you know, misleading way. Uh, for investors, I mentioned it before, it's, it's a very, very uh, you know, good opportunity. We haven't had a single default in, in, you know, since the fund started, um, and that's, that's something to be proud of. But all of this is possible at the end of the day because we have great tools. Um, this may remind you of you know, the, the sticker table out there. Um, it's an amalgamation of different open source libraries that many of you are probably familiar with. Uh, Py, Pandas, SciPy, um, XGBoost, Matplotlib, Luigi, NumPy, Dask, Spacey. You can see the rest. So high level risk management overview, we're going to be breaking down, um, you know, these blue boxes represent kind of process, the red boxes represent different types of risk that we'll be addressing, and then the green boxes up top address specific components of that risk that we're, we're effectively mitigating. So let's get started. First thing, concentration risk. Simply put, all things, all things equal, if you have two suppliers and one of them is only invoicing two buyers and the other one is invoicing 10 buyers, what does that tell you? That tells you that one is a lot more diverse and you know, the likelihood if one of those buyers says, we don't want your goods anymore, you know, then that, that takes down their accounts receivable by 50% overnight. Right? You'd rather have a more diversified supplier that's doing business with multiple buyers. Um, so just to make that a little bit more clear. You can see a, a two buyer scenario here, a three buyer scenario here, and this, this supplier has, I can't count that, maybe eight or nine different uh, buyers. And this is easy stuff in Pandas, right? Just a little, little pivot table, a little group buy, whatever you want, then a stacked area plot, obviously using latest and greatest color maps. Um, this is easy stuff. And you know we can calculate those percentages over time. Um, and score somebody more favorably if they have more diversity. There's also this notion of junk. So who's familiar with, you know, Moody's um, bond ratings, for example, right? Okay. So if a particular buyer, like let's pick on Payless Shoes, for example. Do you think Payle if a supplier was doing business with Payless Shoes and then another supplier is doing business with Costco, who would you rather, who would you rather uh, lend to? the supplier that's, bar that's doing business with Costco, because the likelihood of Costco going out of business tomorrow and not you know, fulfilling their debt obligations is pretty low. So we can factor in junk. And that's to say that a higher percentage of their accounts receivable coming from a buyer that we deem junk uh, effectively penalizes them. So that kind of covers concentration risk. Now, we'll, we'll talk mostly about default risk. It's obviously the, the biggest area that, that we're thinking about. And default risk basically translates to the what's the likelihood that this uh, supplier that you're lending to is not going to be able to pay back, pay you back and fulfill their, their obligation. Uh, so one way that we can mitigate this risk is by forecasting their accounts receivable. So if I'm engaging in a 40-day lending agreement with a supplier, wouldn't it be nice to be able to forecast down to a very small margin of error how much accounts receivable that particular supplier is going to have coming in the door? Uh, yes. Yes, it would. So there are quite a few different forecasting libraries out there to do this sort of thing. Um, you know, who, who here uses R for forecasting? Okay, a couple who uses Python for forecasting. Okay, about, about the same. Um, R has a lot of libraries that have been quote unquote battle tested, that have been around for quite some time, um, and they're, they're quite fantastic. But, uh, you know, caveat here is that we're also evaluating new tools like PyFlux, um, and I know that stats models 
is also implementing some of these models in, in future releases as well. Uh, but things like your autoregressive integrated moving average, uh, you know, Holt Winters, exponential smoothing, uh, Bayesian structural time series, uh, which is a, a, a more recent uh, methodology than some of these others, and then you know your good old good old fashioned OLS or polynomial regression. Um, and this is what it looks like. So this is a supplier that has a very, very evident uh, seasonal pattern here. And you can see the red is their 90-day forecast. 90 days is the, the maximum duration that we would be willing to engage in a lending agreement with a supplier. So that's what we're concerned with forecasting out. We require at least five quarters, right, because we're going to go ahead and fit our model on an entire year's worth of data, and then we want to back test it on the, the last quarter. So five, five quarters makes sense there. And then the image on your right shows what our forecast would have actually been 90 days ago versus the actuals. So you see that we're, we're getting quite close here um, without showing you, you know, the actual MAPE and RMSE. Um, here's another example of a supplier. These guys have an invoicing pattern that's like a metronome. Very predictable cash coming in and cash going out. Um, I didn't mention this subplot down here. Uh, this is actually a ratio of their adjustments to invoices. So when I'm talking about invoices, think about a positive inflow and an adjustment, a negative outflow. So when, when, it, when that goes out of whack, when they have some unprecedented outflows of cash, that should be concerning. That should raise some, raise some, uh, you know, raise some alarms. Um, but up here, you can see that they have a very, very predictable um, uh, adjustment accounts receivable pattern, at least over the history that we've observed. And there are a couple other things going on in this visualization that that I'll touch on in a little bit. Uh, but the two things that we we really look at to evaluate this best model strategy are. Uh, the MAPE, the, the mean absolute percentage error, and the RMSE, the root mean squared error, uh, for the back test. And we run through each one of those models that I mentioned before, whether it's you know simple regression, polynomial regression, Bayesian structural time series. We do that, every one of those models with different parameter configurations on a nightly basis for 200,000 suppliers. So we're literally running millions of models every single evening so that we can have the best forecast possible every single day. Um, and, you know, just in this plot here, you can see various annotations, some subplot action, all, all these things made possible because of Matplotlib's, you know, high, high level of customization. Um, you know, sometimes you can, there are clean, like more straightforward APIs out there, but for just extensibility, um, you, know, you can do some pretty great stuff in Matplotlib if you're looking for a static uh, image. So let's move on a little bit to seasonality. So if a supplier is, is highly seasonal, so let's say they go through like a, a big hill and then they have a serious valley, if you are about to lend to them for 40 days or something like that, you want to lend to them when they're about to go up that hill as opposed to when they're about to go down that valley. So we can kind of understand seasonality at a very granular level by running uh, a seasonal decomposition, which is available in stats models. Basically, this is the original signal up here. And we're decoupling the seasonality component from the trend component. The trend component is, is in the green here. And then you can see the seasonality component in orange. And then the residual is everything that's left over that can't be explained by, by those two uh, vectors. So very important to understand seasonality as well. Now that we've kind of talked about forecasting their accounts receivable, uh, we can talk about predicting AR discontinuation. So I want to make a very clear distinction between what I'm calling AR discontinuation and bankruptcy. So bankruptcy, you know, complete nuclear event, they put their hands up in the air and they can't fulfill their debt obligations. Uh, but AR discontinuation from our perspective is when they cease to invoice uh, the buyers that they were historically invoicing. So we can train a classifier to do that. What's the probability that they're going to flatline in 45 days? Okay. Uh, and in order to do that, though, we have to be meticulous about how we're preparing our data. Uh, you guys have heard of data leakage. Show of hands, who's heard of that term? Okay. Basically, you do not want to be able to observe that which would have not been observable at the point that you want to make the prediction. So since we want a 45-day jump on when somebody is going to flatline, uh, in terms of their accounts receivable, we have to go back 
45, we have to first label all of our suppliers, right? Did they flatline or did they not flatline for this period of time? And then we want to truncate that data 45 days before that and then start engineering features off of that truncated data set. Um, because, you know, if you didn't do that, that you wouldn't be able to make those, 45, those predictions 45 days out um, the right way. So um, then we can start engineering features. So just a little suggestion. I, I found this method of feature engineering for this type of problem to be very effective. I usually like to engineer features based on, you know, aggregate stats over their entire history. Then I might take some type of like windowed history, like maybe the last 13 weeks or something, and engineer the same features off of, off of that period. And then maybe, um, you know, some additional features just on that, on that last observable day. So engineering different features with diff over different time windows um, has proven effective for, for us. So features engineered, data truncated, check, check, let's keep going. So we use Scikit for uh, some of the additional uh, preparation, you know, when we're talking about encoding categoricals, creating polynomial features, scaling, uh, reducing dimensionality, and all that fun stuff. Um, and then we have uh, a pipeline of models that run uh, to determine the best model, but lo and behold, a lot of times uh, gradient boosted trees end up winning out, which you need to be very careful that you're, you're not overfitting for, um, because it's very easy to do that. Um, but the, the Scikit has an API for XGBoost. Um, so, you know, if you're creating a pipeline in Scikit and you're very familiar with Scikit's API and you don't want to, you know, use the XGBoost one, um, there's actually a way to instantiate uh, a gradient boosted tree in, in, in the Scikit fashion, uh, which, is, which is nice for a maintainable pipeline. Um, and then for hyperparameter tuning, we're currently using the Hyperopt library. Uh, I should note, though, that Hyperopt seems like it has not been actively developed for a little while. Um, so, you know, you have to pay attention to those kind of things. Uh, but we're currently evaluating Spearmint, which does uh, Bayesian op optimization as well. At the end of the day, we're concerned about uh, recall. So I don't want to beat this point into the ground, you know, the difference between precision and recall, uh, type 1, type 2 errors here, too much. But basically, we, it costs us a lot if we get this classification wrong. If somebody ends up flatlining and ceasing to invoice those buyers and not being able to fulfill their debt obligation, guess what? That's a default in the portfolio. Guess what? That creates a lot of uncertainty with our investors. That creates all sorts of problems. So we're very, very concerned about optimizing for recall here and, of course, not overfitting. So we talked about default discontinuation or um, AR discontinuation, but now let's talk about bankruptcy. So bankruptcy can happen for a lot of different reasons. Maybe um, you know the executive team um, overnight had a big argument or something. Maybe uh, there was some type of macroeconomic condition that came about that was damaging to that particular business. Maybe there was policy change. Um, you know, there could be a host of different things. But based on C2FO's data advantage, we would have no clear competitive advantage over any other, you know, bank or, or commercial lender for predicting those types of things with, with our data. Um, so we want to use our data in conjunction with some, uh, some third-party data uh, to do that. Um, but that's not the easiest thing to do. Who's familiar with PACERS, the PACERS database? It's like a, a global database with bankruptcy information, has a really awful website um, and a really terrible ABI. Uh, but anyway, it's the only place that you can go for bankruptcy data, really. Um, that's, that's like the source. So once we pull down all this data from PACERS, um, you know, on a nightly basis, we need to figure out, OK, is Bob's Plumbing the same as Bob's Plumbing LLC, you know, whatever we called them in our database? So we have to figure out, you know, who's who, who matches up. Um, and then we need to, the same way I was talking about before, truncate the data and engineer some features, enrich it with macro data. Um, and then you have to address a class imbalance problem too, right? Because think about the proportion of businesses that go out of business versus stay in business. Uh, so there's an imbalance there. And then we need to train some models. But I want to talk about this uh, matching process because we learned a lot in, in doing it. And I think what we did was, was pretty novel and pretty applicable for others too. 
Um, obviously, we want to convert to lowercase, remove special characters, all that super obvious stuff first. Uh, then I want to do the easy stuff first. When I start talking about string matching and sound X's, that stuff is harder. Okay, if I have a tax ID on both sides of the fence, you better believe I'm going to use that first. If I have a phone number on both sides of the fence, I'm going to use that first. I'm going to do the easy stuff before the hard stuff, reduce the load on you know, the, the batch processing that I have to do. Then what I do to make my feature space or my um, search space a little bit smaller is use sound X's. Right? We, can, we can take a term, convert it to a sound X, and then only run string matching on the sound X's that are in the ballpark. Uh, so that you know helps the runtime for this stuff because it's expensive to do some of these things. When you start talking about Levenstein distance, Yara Winkler distance, Jacquard distance, uh, these are all expensive processes when you need to do them for over 200,000 suppliers on a nightly basis, along with all of the other modeling that I talked about. So uh, using using the sound X's helps reduce that that search space a little bit. And then what we do last is calculate the geo distance. That's to say that you know maybe um, maybe a company is headquartered in Wilmington, Delaware. Uh, a lot of companies are incorporated there because they have lax tax laws and, and some other reasons. Uh, but in any case, um, if we see that the distance between one uh, one supplier and then the the bankrupt uh, company that we saw is zero, then that increases our confidence that it's the same exact location, even if. The, the string matching score was a little bit off. Um, so we can just do some you know, basic Haversine distance to, to ensure that, uh, or to have like a multiplicative effect on the score when it's uh, closer. Um, and just, just a pro tip here, if you're rolling your own like Haversine function for some reason, because you can stack overflow that and find 10 different implementations, but when you're doing this sort of thing, if you're compelled to roll your own, I would strongly suggest uh, trying to siphonize or um, wrap it in um, you know, a number uh, JIT decorator um, so that you can stand to benefit from you know, either that just-in-time or static compilation uh, because rolling your own in pure Python won't be the fastest. I can guarantee you that much. So this is what it ends up looking like. We might have Fresh Gourmet Concepts Inc. over here, and then Fresh Gourmet Concepts over here. You can see that uh, some of the string matching comes back really high, but then you can see here that the geo distance was zero. So they have a greater than perfect score here at, at 4.014. Um, another example, Network Salon Services versus, or Network Salon Services LLC, rather, uh, versus Network Salon Services. Um, you can see that their string matching score was not perfect either, uh, but they were only 1.5 mile, miles away. Maybe that was like the store owner who lived you know, around the corner or something like that and used her personal address because it's an LLC uh, sort of thing. So you, you get the point, uh, but that was how we matched up you know, what we saw in the Pacers database with what we had in our database. Just a couple fun facts about bankruptcy since I was looking at that data anyway. Um, when you look at it from 2009 to 2016, you can see that it's you know, going down a little bit, generally speaking, uh, and you know, it makes sense because of the economic crisis. But a lot of conventional wisdom starts bubbling up when you see things like hotels and motels or, um, let's see, eating places as some of the most common SIC codes for, for going out of business. And again, you know, you got to use a good color map. Everybody that works on my team knows that I'm a real stickler for, for visualizations. This isn't my favorite color map on this heat map, but you know it was hard uh, to get this to, to really highlight the, the interesting part of it. So on the x-axis here, you have employee count, and on the y-axis, you have the company sales. So um, kind of makes sense, right? You see up here that the smaller companies with fewer employees, less sales, tend to go out of business a lot more often. That's not to say that some of the big boys never do, but you know, keep this sort of thing in mind if you're thinking about, that's why startups are risky, right? Because it's hard. <laughs> uh, but these, these middle areas tend to go out a lot less often. So we've covered default risk, and I also want to talk about fraud risk. Whenever you're engaging in a lending agreement with somebody, it's like a, hand it's like a handshake. Um, you have to evaluate that that borrower's character on some dimension as well. 
Um, so we do that a couple different ways. And this is where natural language processing comes into play. So if one of our customer service reps is on the phone with one of these suppliers that we've prospected, we record all the conversations. We, um, you know, we use Watson's NLP API to do the, to do the transcriptions. And then we do some of the text mining uh, on our side with, with the Spacey library, which is very nice, very fast. Uh, but here you can see like a little excerpt of, of text that was that tripped a red flag because one of these words was, was said. Uh, and we look for words like debt, leverage, bankruptcy, lien, payroll, the types of things that you would not want to hear if you're thinking about engaging in a lending agreement with somebody. Alcohol, rollover, credit, Cayman Islands, you know, big, big red flags. Um, so it's just not possible or practical for a human to sit there and do all this stuff. So that's where, um, you know, we, we needed to we create a system for, for all of this. Uh, another way that we kind of assess character risk or fraud risk is by analyzing invoice congruency. So I mentioned before that C2FO gets millions of invoices every single evening from all of our buyers, right? Um, when, when a supplier qualifies for a loan, we ask them to upload their invoices, their, um, their in-network invoices and their out-of-network invoices. So if, if in our database, you know, we saw an invoice from... Um, Nordstrom two weeks ago for uh, 450k, and then they send us uh, an invoice from Nordstrom for you know 600k. Okay, we have a way of calling their bluff because we have the source of truth from the buyer. So it's just another way to ensure that you know they're a trustworthy character. I'm not going to go into this. This is pretty straightforward math anyway. But the the basic idea is just to compare what they send us, not only in terms of you know the cumulative amount or the number of invoices, um, but we ultimately arrive at what we call our congruency score, uh, which which tells us how well does what they they sent us match up with what the buyer sent us. Uh, now that we've covered concentration risk, default risk, fraud risk, now we're kind of into the portfolio management side of things. Okay, we've decided that this supplier is not a uh, nefarious character, okay, they're not a default risk, okay, they have plenty of diversification, great. Um, let's go ahead and engage in a uh, lending agreement with them. But the question is, is well, right before we get to that point, um, I should have actually put this slide first, but just like each one of us have a credit score um, that is unique to us, our overall opinion using an amalgamation of all the models that I just mentioned um, is kind of encapsulated in this WFC score. So that's what, that's what this blue distribution down here is, which is, which is roughly normal. Now, these red, this red distribution were suppliers that I mentioned before that you needed to have at least five quarters worth of data for us to make a forecast. But when you don't, um, we still want to be able to score those suppliers up. So classic machine learning exercise, right? We have this population that we have all of these observable features for, and we have their, their known labels, or in this case, it's a score, so a continuous value. Um, so let's go ahead and, and train some sort of regression model to predict what their WFC score would have been so that we have total coverage for our uh, prospect pool or, or you know, population that, that might borrow. Um, Using that WFC score and using all of the information that, that I mentioned before, uh, we can decide on three things, okay? Um, how much should we lend to them? What's their credit limit? What type of duration? And how do they fit into the overall portfolio? So to just give a very you know, straightforward example of how we might decide on what their credit limit might be, let's say that they fall into the top decile for their WFC score then maybe we're willing to lend, to bar, lend them, um, let's say, 50% of what we forecast that they have coming in the door over the next 90 days, okay? Maybe if they fall into the second to top decile, then we're only willing to lend them up to 45% of what we forecasted that they have coming in the door over the next 45 days. So that's how the forecast piece ties into uh, establishing uh, a meaningful uh, credit limit. Um, and then in terms of the, the duration, that has to do with uh, their invoices that they, that they uploaded that they're borrowing against. 
So basically, the higher decile translates to a greater percentage of their um, cumulative forecasts. Um, and rates are kind of a combination of two things. So this is where more proprietary data comes into play. Through the C2FO markets, we've observed how these suppliers have bid in terms of APR, a discount, um, with all of their other invoices with their, uh, for the, their C2FO markets. So those, num those uh, discounts that they're bidding are usually good approximations for what their cost of capital is. So if they have placed bids in the C2FO proper market before, then we might be able to establish you know, some type of, of rate based on that. Um, if not, then you know, we get into uh, kind of a convex optimization problem where we're looking at the overall portfolio, what type of risk they introduce, uh, what the duration is, et cetera, and where we should um, set their rate in order to achieve the, the desired rate of return that we're looking for on the fund. So who should we continue lending to? Once you're in the portfolio, once you've fulfilled your debt obligation to us, that doesn't mean that the next time around, you know, we're just going to go ahead and give you the benefit of the doubt. Um, we monitor all sorts of different things once you're in the portfolio. Things like level shifts. Um, so that's when you have some type of unprecedented spike. Uh, there's a really good R package that Twitter developed called breakout detection that was recently ported over to uh, Python uh, that we used to do some of that. Uh, we look for bid changes. So in the C2FO markets, again, maybe one day somebody's bidding at 10%, but the next day they're up to 20, right? That is a sign of desperation. Like, why are they suddenly willing to, you know, forego so much more? Um, Something must have changed there. So we set off all these triggers on a nightly basis to then uh, kind of get in front of any kind of uh, default possibility. We can also monitor the WFC score that I mentioned before over time, adjustments, uh, buyer reserves, which I don't really need to get into uh, too much. But it ends up looking something like this. Um, we have like their diversity score moving average. We have that junk score that I mentioned before, the moving average, the invoice discontinuation probability, um, a forecast ratio, uh, and a back test ratio, which basically speak to, okay, how favorable is their 90-day uh, forecast and how well did we um, predict their last 90 days based on that back test. And we can monitor these things over time, right? Very intuitive. And when there's a significant shift, then we know there's something wrong um, and we need to get in front of it. So high level overview of risk management. I know I kind of talked about a lot of things there, um, but it was all using those, those libraries that you guys are probably already familiar with, just applying them you know, in, in um, a problem space that, that was conducive um, for that time. Uh, Behind the scenes all stars that I did not mention, things like Anaconda for, for managing our Python and R environments, uh, Luigi for pipeline task orchestration, and Dask just for parallelizing anything um, that, that lends to uh, doing that much. Um, and you can see what our uh, Luigi DAG or directed acyclic graph looks like over here. So Luigi in a nutshell, you know, you can set up all of these tasks and you, know, you have dependencies, and when there's a failure in the pipeline, um, you don't necessarily need to restart the entire pipeline. You have everything kind of serialized in some, or serialized or persisted in some way, shape, or form so that you can restart the pipeline at that point of failure and then keep moving forward. Um, so that's really cool um, because you can see that this graph gets pretty complicated pretty quickly. But if you take a close look at it, all right, everybody see, see it? Okay, now let's do something to it. Let's turn it upside down. Okay, what does that look like? A cobra? Maybe, a little bit. Yes, no, I know it's kind of hard to see. But uh, anyway, I decided to nickname the project Project Cobra, so all hail Project Cobra. All right, unfortunately, I wanted to do a demo, but our VPN is down. I know, a real pain but I did manage to get some screenshots from an old presentation for you. So the only thing that I did not talk about uh, was the web application framework that we used. Uh, is anybody familiar with Spire? Who's heard of R-Shiny? 
Okay, a lot of you heard of RShiny. Basically, it's a Python port of RShiny that uses um, you know, a simple Cherry Pie web server and uh, Jinja 2 for templating. And you know, a data scientist like me that does not consider himself a front-end developer um, can maintain it with, uh, with you know, relative ease. Um, so you, know, you can put in an account number over here and then pull up their information. You can adjust the uh, length of the loan and then that will recalculate their credit limit um, on the fly. You can look at their, um, their historical um, accounts receivable and different uh, levels of aggregation and you can also throw some filters on there. Um, then you can see the, the backtest plot here on the backtest back tab. Uh, as well as the seasonal decomposition and the buyer plot and then the score plot that I mentioned before. And then the other two tabs are really just rendering of uh, data frames um, as tables uh, for additional information like, you know, what SIC was this supplier or what's their annual revenue or something like that. And you can also download all of this information into one nice neat um, tear sheet that then gets copied up to S3 for bookkeeping purposes. Um, but all of this is just terribly straightforward stuff when you use that, that Spire library uh, to do it. And it doesn't require um, you know, any hand-holding from our front-end engineers that have their own kind of products to maintain. So you have to think about these types of things when you're, when you're building you know, a, a system overall like this. You know, is this code that I would want to maintain you know, two years from now? Am I just creating a bunch of technical debt for, for somebody else? Um, you know, you have to be thoughtful of your, of your peers in that way. So I always like to end my talks with a so what. You sat down, you, you listened to me for the last, you know, whatever it was, 30 minutes. Uh, but, but really, so what about all this stuff? So the first thing that I want to mention that actually Peter touched on earlier today too is that objectivity gives way to innovation. I think the way that he stated it was that, um, you know, what was it, like, uh, a, new, a new user or not knowing a particular library is a feature, not a bug or something to that extent. Uh, but, but really just the thought that coming in with a fresh pair of eyes and not necessarily just taking everything as it's, as it's told to you because maybe it doesn't make a whole lot of sense the way that it was being done before. If you look at the risk management systems for a lot of the big banks, they're probably a little bit more involved than what we were doing here but we're probably talking about millions of lines of low-level code that is just a hairball to maintain, right? By approaching this problem objectively, we were able to simplify the code base, meet all of our requirements in a very short amount of time, and create something that has been very effective to date. In the last year and a half, we haven't lost any money in the fund, so it's working quite well. Um, and you've probably heard this one before too, better independent data beats more complex algorithms. Can't drive that point home enough. Um, you can sit there hyperparameter tuning, you know, all night long if you want to. But I would probably start thinking about what kind of data you can use to supplement uh, your existing data, and what type of features you can engineer uh, that you weren't engineering before. Um, and that's going to usually pay off way more than you know just just grid searching some hyperparameters. Um, Trade-offs must be evaluated in light of constraints. That's fairly obvious. Um, another thing for many tasks, you, uh, Python can perform nearly as fast as lower level languages. But you guys probably already know that. We were you know, talking about Cython and Numbo with the just-in-time compilation before. Um, you know, and just in the interest of, of not overcomplicating things and writing code that you would want to maintain yourself, um, you know, use, use Python where you can if, if that's what you know, the data science team is using. Uh, hopefully I've convinced you guys that this Water for Commerce Fund is a win-win scenario. You know, show me where you can get 6.25% in 40 days and, uh, you know, maybe I'll, uh, I'll give you some of my money too um, a little bit later. But a real, real big opportunity for investors, but more importantly, it's, it's really an opportunity for suppliers. I started off talking about C2FO's mission to champion suppliers and to solve that global conundrum of $32 trillion just being locked up in accounts payable and accounts receivable, right? Think about if we were able to repurpose that $32 trillion. Think about the trickle-down effects for the global economy. 
And last but not least, uh, creating great solutions with open source is part of open source too. So oftentimes, you know, you just think about the, the development side of things, but a lot of these projects, a lot of these libraries wouldn't have the trajectory, wouldn't have the momentum unless there were people using them, building great things on the other end. So just some things to keep in mind. Uh, hopefully I have some time for questions here. Okay, yeah, I'll, I'll be here for a few minutes if anybody has any questions. Or you can tweet at me.